Vishnupadaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namane Namaste Sarasati Devi Kauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschacha Deshatarine Vanchakaupata rubyascha kripa sindhu bhaiva cha patita nam pavanebhyo vaishnavibhyo namo namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Hatvaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So welcome, welcome everyone to our ongoing study of the Srimad Bhagavatam at the level of Bhakti by Bhav. And of course we're on the fifth canto looking at the section on Vedic Cosmology. And this evening we're going to look up chapter number 24. Hmm? I'll just share the screen here. Oh. Okay, so... Chapter 24. Previously, we're in chapters, previous chapters, we were hearing about the planets which are above the sun in the universe. The planets above the sun, meaning planets like the pole star, and then also there's other planets, of course, like, well, there's the, Saptar, the Saptarishis, and there's also uh, Jupiter and Saturn and Mars and Venus and these different planets, which are all part of the, plan of the solar system, and they're all above the sun. But there are some planets which are below the sun, and we're going to look at these today. First of all, we're going to look at the planets which are between the sun and the earth. And then, that, that begins with Rahu, and then... <coughs> Excuse me. A lot of rain here, so very easy to get colds. Uh, Climates changing every few minutes. So we have Rahu, and then we have also K2, right? Bro two brothers there. We'll hear about them. And then, oh, before, before Rahu, oh, below Rahu are the planets of uh, the Siddhas, the Charanas, and the Vijadharas. So the Vijadhara, sometimes there's a Krishna Leela story about a Vijadhara who was, t he, he was cursed and he became a, a big serpent and he swallowed Nanda Maharaj. So Vijadharas and the Charanas, the Siddhas, those who have yoga perfections, live on Siddha Loka. And then there's other planets also, which are between the sun and the earth. For example, Yakshaloka and Rakshaloka. So obviously the planets where the Yakshas and the Rakshas live. So they're in between the earth and the, the sun. And then we'll go on to hear about the planets which are below the earth. 
and there are seven planets which are below the earth, Atala, Vitala, uh, Sutala, Talatala, Matala, Rasatala, and Patala. These planets, we'll talk about each of those, and we'll read about what's the nature of the life there. All right, so this is basically what's in chapter 24. So the chapter begins with hearing about Rahu. Rahu. Uh, those of you, of course, who've read the Srimad Bhagavatam will be familiar with Rahu. That Rahu is... Uh, Rahu is actually an Asura, a demon. But when the de demigods and the demon were churning the ocean of nectar, Mohini Murti came along and said she would distribute the nectar. And the demons and the demigods agreed to let Mohini Murti take the nectar and distribute it. So she began giving all the nectar to the demigods. And then what happened, one of the, this Rahu, very cunning fellow, sat down in between the sun and the moon. And Mohini Murti inadvertently gave some nectar to this demon, who, because the demon had changed himself to look like a demigod. And he was sitting there between the sun and the moon. But then they told Mohini Murti that he's a demon, this is a demon, this is not a demigod. And so Mohini Murti used the Surashan Chakra to decapitate Rahu. So Rahu had taken some of the nectar in, so his head stayed alive. The nectar hadn't, didn't have a chance to go down to his body. So only the head stayed alive. And when she cut off the head, the body died. But the, uh, another, another, other Puranas, they described that there was also, Ketu was also there. Ketu is like the brother of Rahu. And Ketu had actually drank the nectar. He'd also got some nectar. And he'd actually drank it. And so when she cut off his head, his head died because there's no nectar there anymore. The nectar was, had all gone into his body. So he was left with a body with no head. And Rahu has a head and no body. And so the, it was arranged that in, because they have to sh the demigods have to show the effect of the nectar, that this is a nectar of immortality. So these two demons, although they were demons, they have these immortal bodies. So it was arranged that Rahu would get a snake body and Ketu would get a snake head. And in this way, <laughs> they have to exist. I have a picture of this. I have to show, I want to show you that picture. Uh, I hope I can show you somehow. Yes, here we are. Are you able to see this slide? Yes, Maharaj. Oh, you can see. Oh, good. Oh, okay. So you can see Ketu with the snake head, and here's Rahu with the snake body. And of course, they've, they've got this position, they've been given the position of planets in the planetary system. So, it's a big position for them, for demons. Usually demons, they have to, they reside below the earth in the, in the darker regions of the universe. But because they got some nectar, they're given this position, they actually have, they have their planets. And they're the, the deity of these two planets, Rahu and Ketu. Of course, they give a lot of trouble in the universe because Rahu is always en envious of the sun and the moon, so it was arranged. He 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 uh, he uh, 
often tries to, here you can see Rahu and Ketu. <laughs> they look nice. <laughs> and here's Rahu swallowing the earth. That's his nature. When, this is, of course, when the eclipse takes place that Rahu tries to cover the earth. It's another interesting presentation of Rahu with his snake body. Okay, so Rahu. So Rahu's got this position to be one of the planets in the in the universe, and of course he he gives he gives us trouble that the eclipses come and the eclipses are inauspicious. When there's an an eclipse, we shouldn't look at it because a great personality is being offended by a lesser personality. The greater personality are the sun god or the moon god who are being covered by the lesser personality in the form of Rahu or maybe Ketu. And they, when they come in front of the, the sun or the moon, then it's an offense on their part. So when a, 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 when a senior person is being offended, we don't want to look, we don't want to see. So we should never look at the eclipse when it's taking place. And we should stay, we shouldn't eat, we shouldn't drink, and we don't worship the deity, usually they close the deities, and uh, wait for the eclipse to pass, and after the eclipse passes, then we should take bath and change our clothes, you shouldn't cook any food, any food which was cooked before the eclipse, you don't, cannot eat it, you have to finish the food, whatever's prepared, you should eat it before the eclipse, because any food which is around during the eclipse is no longer pure. So, so many things. Prabhupada was not very particular about these things, but some, of course, usually in, in India generally, it's customary to follow these things. Some people say Prabhupada didn't follow it because he didn't have the panchaka with him. But sometimes, Prabhupada would say, like, you can close the curtains, keep the puja going, make the offerings behind the curtains. And during the eclipse, it's, it's a good time to go and give charity. And we see in the Srimad Bhagavatam how Lord Krishna came with all of his family members from Dwarka at the time of the solar eclipse. They came all the way to Kurukshetra to perform sacrifices and to give charity to the great sages. Of course, Lord Krishna had another reason for coming there, that he could also meet with the gopis, which he did. He met with all the gopis there at Kurukshetra. Lord Chaitanya was born during the time of a solar eclipse. And it said at that time, 1486, on the, uh, on the, the Purnima, that everyone was taking bath. So customary, another way in which they observe the eclipse is that all the Hindus will go and take bath in the Ganga and chant the holy name. We were here in Mayapur, I remember, we had one year on Gorpunima, there was an eclipse, and it, we all went to take bath. Everyone, we all went along down to the Ganga and took her bath during the time of the eclipse. But at the same time, being careful not to look at the eclipse. All right, so. Uh, the chapter begins with uh, this information about Rahu, which moves like one of the stars. The presiding deity of that planet 
who is the son of Simhika, is the most abominable of all Asuras. But although he is completely unfit to assume the position of a demigod or planetary deity, he has achieved that position by the grace of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. <laughs> so, that's uh, the mercy of Krishna, that although he's such a rascal, such a demonic person, he's given this position of being a planetary deity. All right, then we go on to hear a bit more about Rahu and the Sun Globe. Uh, the Moon extends, oh, first of all, the Sun Globe is 10,000 Yojanas. The Moon extends for 20,000 Yojanas and Rahu extends for 30,000 Yojanas. Rahu tried to create dissension between the sun and the moon by interposing himself between them. Rahu is inimical towards both the sun and the moon and therefore he always tries to cover the sunshine and moonshine on the dark moon day and the full moon night. So these eclipses are regular, they occur, you get like usually like five or so in, in a year. There'll be maybe two solar eclipses and three lunar eclipses in the course of one year. And they will occur about, occur about the same time every year. You get annual eclipses. Okay, after, text 3, after hearing from the sun and the moon demigods about Rahu's attack, the Supreme Personality of Godhead Vishnu engage, engages his disc, the Surasan Chakra, to protect them. So he showed the picture of Rahu trying to devour the earth. So at that time, the Lord will send the Surasan Chakra. And as soon as the Surasan Chakra appears, then Rahu will run for it because the heat is unbearable to him. He cannot tolerate the heat of the, of the Surashan Chakra. Surashan Chakra is for killing non-devotees. So it's unbearable to Rahu, and he therefore flees in fear of it. During the time Rahu disturbs the sun and moon, there occurs what people commonly know as an eclipse. In the purport, Prabhupada writes, the controlling demigods are most obedient to Lord Vishnu, although they also want material sense enjoyment, and that is why they are called demigods, or almost godly. Right, demigods are not pure devotees, they have some material desires, but they have a lot of piety because it, to get that position of a demigod, they have to have a lot of piety, a lot, they have to have done a lot of pious activities. So they take part in overseeing the affairs of the universe. And therefore Lord Krishna, he is concerned about them, he's always concerned for their welfare. And he helped because he knows they're maintaining the universe. So Lord Vishnu or Lord Krishna said that sometimes he will come they will have to come and help the demigods to defeat the demons because there's always this conflict going on between the demigods and the demons. And Prabhupada compares the scientists going to the moon, he said this is like Rahu's attack on the moon. So these scientists are like another Rahu. And he said just as Rahu is never successful, the attempts of the scientists also will never be successful. Um, as devotees, of course, we're very doubtful that they ever went to the moon, but we have to wait and see in course of time. 
gradually everything will be revealed, what is actually the position. And the, you'd have to go through the Van Allen radiation belt, which is doubtful any, any living being could go through that radiation belt, it's so powerful. And there are many other factors. Just like in the Puranas, it tells about how there was this one person he wanted to, uh, Trish, Trishanku, he wanted to go to the heavenly, he wanted to go to the moon, he wanted to go to the higher planets, but he wasn't qualified. <laughs> so when he got there, they sent him back. <laughs> The, the demigods on the moon sent him back, they knew he wasn't qualified. And so Vritasura made a special planet for him, so that he could go there. Some of the things which these people do are just amazing. Okay, so then Rahu, below Rahu, uh, is Siddha Loka, Charana Loka and the Vijadara Loka. So Siddha Lokas, the people living there all have yoga cities, Asta cities, eight different kinds of cities, yoga perfections. And they can travel from one place to another in their aeroplanes, they have the yoga powers. They don't even need aeroplanes, they can just fly themselves. They don't need visas and passports and things. They don't need to have vaccinations and stuff, and they don't have to worry about all of these things. They have yoga powers, and by their yoga powers they can go against the laws of nature. So there's a whole planet of these people, which is above the earth and below the sun, Siddha Loka, and the Vijadharas. Vijadharas are also like demigods. A little bit lower than the demigods, but still they, very, they have to have a lot of piety to get there to Vijadara Loka. So it's described how the, one of the residents of Vijadara Loka, he committed an offence against a great sage and he was cursed to become a snake. So he became a big serpent in the Yamuna river and it happened that one day Nanda Maharaj was camping there along the banks of the Yamuna with other men. So this big serpent came out and began to swallow Nanda Maharaj. And nobody could do anything about it. So then they called for Lord Krishna and Lord Krishna immediately came and simply from the touch of his foot he transformed that serpent into the demigod, the Vijadara a resident of the higher planets. So then they asked, what happened? How can you tell us, who are you? And so then this demigod, this Vijadara, resident of Vijadara planet, explained how he committed an offence against a great sage, and the sage cursed him to become a big snake. But by the touch of Lord Krishna's lotus foot, he was transformed, he regained his divine form again. So that's a nice chapter because in that chapter there's an important verse which speaks about the power of simply hearing the holy name. That if one simply hears the holy name one can be liberated. So the loud chanting of the holy name is recommended and that verse which appears there in that chapter was quoted by Haridas Thakur when he was asked, why do you chant loudly? So he quoted this verse from the Srimad Bhagavatam and says, anybody who hears the holy name, they become liberated. So he said, I want people to hear the holy name, they can be liberated. So that's the Vijadharas. So their planets are in, situated in the sky called Antariksha. This Antariksha area, this is the area between Swarga and Bhumandala. It's Bhuvar, 
loka, like that. That's the intermediate area. It's sometimes it's called antariksha, and sometimes it's called bhuvar loka. So it's the places of enjoyment for the yakshas, rakshasas, pichachas, ghosts, and so on. Antariksha extends as far as the wind blows and the clouds float in the sky. Above this, there is no more air. And so it's surprising to note these creatures like Raksh yakshas, rakshasas, and ghosts, and pishachas. They're not very auspicious kind of people, but they're there, and they're higher in the universe than our earth planet. They're situated a little higher, but of course it doesn't mean that these are actually very pious living entities. But they do have some kinds of powers. As mentioned here, it said, uh, places of enjoyment. These are all places of enjoyment for these people. So they have their holiday resorts, if you like, places of resorts. And then below the abode of the Yakshas and the Rakshasas, you come to Earth, the planet Earth. Its upper limit it extends as high as swans, hawks, eagles, and similar large birds can fly. So these lar large birds like swans and hawks and eagles, they can fly quite high in the sky and sometimes there, uh, there have, have been incidences where they give trouble to airplanes. Aviation have to be very aware of these kind of birds flying in the sky, because if they get, you know, if they get caught in the engine, then, well, your engine's had it, and the plane's going to have to make a crash landing. So, <laughs> this is one of the dangers of flying airplanes. The air, this, this, the, air, the, this, the air is the place for the birds, it's not really the place for people. We're not really meant to be flying around in big airplanes. And if we run into these birds, then certainly it's a problem. Okay, so the, this is the region which is above the earth. And now, Text number, number seven goes on. We're going to hear about the regions which are below the earth. So there are seven planets. So let's divide them up. Let, how many people have we got here today, Prabhu? We have 16, Maharaj. 16, so we can have, uh, let's see, we want seven, seven groups. And we'll give each group one planet to speak about. All right. Okay, so it'll be two people in some groups and three in other groups. And group one will have Atala, and group two Vitala, and group three Sutala, group four Talatala, group five Mahatala, group six Rasatala, and group seven. Patala. And we want to know what's going on there, who's there, what's the nature of the life there. Tell us something about the conditions in which these people are living there. Is, is that okay? That's fine. And we'll just give you five minutes. I don't, I don't think you need much time. <laughs>
Okay, can we close the groups, Prabhu? Another two more minutes, Sister Maharaj. Okay, two more minutes. Everybody's back, Maharaj. Oh, very good. All right. So let's have here first of all from group number one, Atala. What's going on there? Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Please accept our humble obeisances. My obeisances to you. Atala, uh, in Atala planet, uh, there is a demon, uh, son of uh, Maya Dhanava, uh, named uh, Bala. And uh, he has created 96 uh, different kinds of mystic power. So, and uh, uh, yogis, uh, like the so-called yogis uh, and uh, swamis, they take advantage of this mystic power even, and they cheat the people even today also. And uh, simply by yawning, uh, the demon, uh, he has the uh, bala, he has created three kinds of women. One is uh, Swairini, Kamini and Pushchali. The Swairini, she, uh, Swairini is like to marry men from uh, their own group, but Kamini is the marry men from any group. And uh, Pushchali is, uh, uh, they change husbands one after another. So, the if any man who enters uh, the planet of uh, Hatala, uh, they, these women immediately uh, captured the, him and uh, induced uh, him to drink uh, an intoxicating uh, beverage uh, which is made of uh, for some drugs, uh, attaka, cannibals, uh, cannabis, uh, some indica. And uh, this intoxicant handles that man with the great sexual uh, prowess. Mm. Of which the women they will take advantage for enjoyment. So this is how they are living with the sense gratification. And uh, yes, Prabhupada tells us. He says that the, in one of the purports, he says that the, the sense gratification of the demigods is sometimes disturbed. Yeah. And uh, uh, Maharaj, one more point, Prabhupada. That uh, illusioned, they are illusioned and intoxicated uh, by false pride, and uh, they think himself uh, themselves as a god, ignoring uh, impending uh, death. But uh, time is the dominating factor. So, uh, 
so with their uh, like uh, only the death uh, they are afraid of only the time factor uh, they're afraid of the time factor hmm. yeah the uh, Prabhupada explains in relation to these people living below the earth that above the earth the demigods they have some sense gratification but sometimes their sense gratification may be disturbed can you can you do you know what when will, when will the sense gratification of the demigods be disturbed what? when uh, demons attack the uh, demigods right when the demons come to attack so sometimes they get and sometimes they're defeated Sometimes they lose their guru, they offend Brihaspati, and they don't have the blessings of the guru. Sometimes time is against them, it's not in their favor, and they're defeated. But for the demons, they don't have that problem. These people who are living below the earth, they have a life without that kind of disturbance. The only thing which disturbs them, that, as you said, time. That in the course the, the time factor will come. Maybe Sudarsan Chakra may come like that, telling them that their time is over. Alright, so certainly doesn't sound like a very <laughs> attractive place that we would want to go. Hearing about it, you know, it sounds really Horrible, actually. <laughs> but yes, but w w it's the nature of life that people, what, no matter what situation they're in, they actually think it's okay. You know, they think it's okay. You know, I'm I'm okay. You know, I'm having a good time. Even they're we're living in the most horrible conditions, and but. These people are actually thinking, no, no, we're all right, we're, we have our sense gratification. So that these people are either Daichas, Dhanavas or Nagas. <laughs> and generally they're householders, Prabhupada says, most of them live as householders. They have their families, they have their, and they're, in this way they're, they're thinking they're enjoying. But of course for us it sounds really horrible, it's morbid, ooh. Just hearing about it we think, well, my goodness, definitely don't want to go there for a holiday. Don't want to take a birth there. And Prabhupada writes, a Vaishnava is always anxious to give all such bewildered materialists the real happiness of spiritual bliss. That's in the purport of text number eight. So hearing about these lower planets, and of course not only the lower planets, the higher planets are also, you know, <laughs> not very one appealing, you know, we shouldn't be, we shouldn't be drawn to them. Although it sounds, certainly it's heavenly, the opulence and so on, but we shouldn't be bewildered by it. <coughs> Excuse me. Rather we should understand that everywhere the problem is birth and death. We have, to, we have to recognize what is the real danger, the real threat in these situations. So, Abrahma Bhuvanao Loka Punar Avartano Arjuna, from the highest planet down to the lowest. So we're hearing in this section we heard about the highest, the higher planets, the heavenly planets, and we heard the people in the heavenly planets, they're not happy. They want to come down to Bharat Vars. They want to get a birth in Bharat Vars again so that they can do bhakti and go back to Godhead. Now these people below the earth, 
they're not thinking like that. But when we hear about it, we feel sorry for them. Some people need to go there and preach. We need to think about going there to preach. Make a center there. Huh? Who wants to go there? Atala Loka. Is it? Atala Loka? Want to go there and preach? My goodness. Ooh. <laughs> Just like <laughs> when Prabhupada was sending people, Prabhupada told devotees to go to China to preach. So one devotee said, Prabhupada, the people there, they, they eat dogs there. And Prabhupada said to him, he said, well, people in your country eat cows. He said, they're even more sinful. He said, these people in China, they're only eating dogs and snakes, but you people kill cows. That's much worse. So everywhere in the material world is horrible. We shouldn't be attracted. All right, then after Atala Loka, the next planet is Vitala. Who's going to tell us about Vitala Loka? Hare Krishna, please accept my humble obeisance to Guru Maharaj. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Jai, all glories to Prabhupada. <laughs> so, Guru Maharaj, it's, it's mentioned that. Uh, uh, below Atal is Vital, where Lord Shiva is staying, and uh, he's uh, he's uh, the master there of many gold mines, and he lives there with his personal associates, ghosts, and similar living entities. And uh, he's the progenitor, and when uh, uh, he uh, engages with uh, Bhavani, and then when they produce living entities. Uh, a river is from, formed from the vital fluids known as Hataki. And uh, when fire, uh, uh, like ablaze by the wind, drinks this river and spits it out, their gold is produced called Hataka. And all the demons who live over there with their wives decorate themselves with ornaments made from this gold. And it's mentioned that they live there happily. And uh, there, uh, Srila Prabhupada describes that how gold can be uh, created, uh, quoting the analogy of uh, Sri Sanatan Goswami, that when they are questioned that how people can be raised to Brahmanical platform and even beyond, he quotes the verse that how bell metal is turned into gold by treating it with mercury. Similarly, a low-born person can be converted into a Brahmana by properly, properly, properly teaching them about Vaishnav activities. So uh, there, uh, Srila Prabhupada quotes this uh, analogy. Uh, where, where? Which verse? Uh, in the purport, in the purport, Yatha Kanchanatam Yati. Verse number 17, Maharaj. 17? Yeah, 1 7, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, go ahead, Prabhu. It is, so this was Yatha Kanchanatam Yati. Kamsyam rasa vidhanataha tatha diksha vidhanena dvijatvam jayate nrinam. As one can transform kamsa or bell metal into gold by treating it with mercury, one can also turn a low born man into a brahmana by initiating him properly into Vaishnava activities. So, the, the, uh, because of this mention of uh, gold in the Vital Lok, there Srila Prabhupada quotes this analogy also that how someone low born can directly come to the platform of a Brahmana because many times this objection would be raised. <laughs> yes, so, uh, in 1968, the devotees heard from Prabhupada about this, about how you could make gold by an alchemical process. So the Prabhupada was also talking how we need money to spread the Krishna consciousness movement. So the devotees thought we should make gold. So one, one of the devotees, one of the senior devotees, Rupanuga Prabhu, he wrote to Prabhupada and told Prabhupada, 
we want to make some gold, we want to make gold by this alchemical process. <laughs> so Prabhupada told him, he said, I don't think you should try this. He said, it is not certain that you will make the gold. It is not certain that you will be successful. He said, unless something is certain, you don't want to waste your time on it. And then Prabhupada also said, and he said, I also think Krishna won't give you the gold like this. He said, because I know if Krishna gives you gold, you'll think of the gold, you won't think of Krishna. <laughs> so Prabhupada was not encouraged, he didn't encourage the devotees to try to produce gold. But the real gold, of course, is that people will become pure devotees. That's, that's the real gold. And I explained the other night also how gold in the material world is jada, it's dead matter. But the gold of the demigods is semi-spiritual, semi semi-matter. And just like in the spiritual world, the gold is fully spiritual, it's fully conscious. Everything is conscious in the spiritual world. Krishna's mirror, Krishna's comb, Krishna's brush, Krishna, everything is conscious. And so the gold, is, the ornaments of Krishna are also conscious, they're also personalities. Krishna has his kastuba jam, like that. And there's a book where it names all of the different ornaments of Lord Krishna. They're all persons and they appear in this form to serve Krishna. So consciousness is there in the, in the spiritual world but not here in the material world. So as devotees we have to be careful not to be too much allured by gold. We know Harani Kashipu, he was very eager to get gold. And his brother Haranyaksha dug up the earth searching for gold and he created some disturbance in the universe causing the earth planet to fall into the bottom of the Garbhadak ocean. So there's so many dangers can come. We get too much occupied in searching after gold. So Prabhupada didn't worry, although Prabhupada went to the West with no money, he, he didn't worry about it. He just simply preached and depended on Krishna. Prabhupada saw other people, they became so much concerned about money and bricks and cement and land, they wanted the properties. But Prabhupada was just concerned about the preaching mission to keep up the preaching activities and to keep the purity. That's the real gold. So we shouldn't be too much overwhelmed by desires to get gold, to find gold. Some, t some devotees even, they went looking for gold and they spend a lot of money, they heard that during the World, Second World War, the Japanese had taken a lot of treasure and hidden it in the jungle. And some devotees, they went looking for the gold, to try to find the gold. And some other devotees, they went looking for precious jewels, to do mining, they wanted to get big money. And the result was they simply lost their Krishna consciousness. The whole basis of spiritual life was forgotten about. They got so much into the, the economic issues. And that's not what's important. What's important is to keep our Krishna consciousness. So we have to be very careful not to be too much allured by gold. Okay, so that's Vitala. We heard about Lord Shiva and Bhavani and of course they're 
they're in different places, right? We heard that, you know, they had also Kailash there, which was up in Jumbo Dweep. He had his place there. And so he's here also. And how they're producing the gold. We have to understand Lord Shiva is a very transcendental personality. And we, we see how the people there, how they, they're, they're attracted, they become happy. What makes them happy? The gold, that they can dress in gold, they can have all these ornaments of gold. One man wanted to get, he wanted to collect money to buy gold ornaments for the deities. I remember one time in London, in London, we had Radha, we have Radha Landanishwara there in central London. The very first deities in the movement were the big, de big deities of Radha and Krishna to be installed in London there. So uh, one man was coming there and he said, we should buy gold ornaments for the deities. And he said, I will collect money and we will buy the gold ornaments for the deities. But Prabhupada didn't like it. He thought it's not a very good idea. He said, if you have a lot of gold, it will simply attract thieves. And Prabhupada explained, he said, in the past, many temples in India, they did have a lot of gold. They had a lot of valuable jewels for the deities. But gradually they would all get stolen and they all went missing. And this is the fact that Many of the treasures and the gold and the jewels of the different deities have gone missing. Of course, we heard recently that like that uh, Venk Venkateshwar temple in Trivandrum, they found in the, below, the, in, the, in, the, in the basement there in the temple, they found a lot of treasure there of the deities. So that was nice. They kept the deities' ornaments safely there. But not all deities have been so fortunate like that. Many other deities, they had a lot of very nice ornaments, but in course of time, people would take them and steal them. So it's, we, we don't want to just attract thieves. One time, in, even in Mayapur, people came, they had cut, heard that the, the deities were gold, and some dacoits came. Uh, this was in Prabhupada's time, they came there and they had guns and bombs, and they threw a bomb and blew off a devotee's leg. His Holiness Bhakti Raghava Swami lost his leg at that time when they threw a bomb. And uh, another time in Africa, people came in our temple in Nairobi. They came and they, they had injured, they, they, not, they stabbed one of our devotees there. He was seriously injured with a stab wound, protecting the deities. So it's, it's a very dangerous thing to keep a lot of valuable jewels on the deities. Of course, some temples they do it, like in Sri Rangam, I know they have very, very valuable jewels. Their mood of worshipping the deity, of course, is different. The, the Sri Vaishnavas, they worship Lakshmi Narayan in the mood of awe and reverence, in the mood of Aishwarya, and so that's very opulent. So they put a lot of very valuable jewels on the deity, different gems and so on. But it's very risky. You have to have a very powerful community and a very strong uh, system of security to protect these things. Okay, so after Vitala Loka, we come to Sutala Loka, right? That's a, an important place. So who's going to tell us about Sutala Loka? Hare Krishna Maharaj, Parman Krishna Prabhu will speak. Thank you. Hare Krishna Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. Maharaj, well, this is the uh, most important Loka, I would say, below the earth. This is the place where our 
one of the Mahajan states, Badli Maharaj, the grandson of Prahlad, son of Virochana, which the Sukhdev Goswami says will be describing more about him in the Canto 8. But here uh, he speaks about the Bali Maharaj, how he is staying here, and uh, it is mostly focused this whole uh, chapter here about Uttar Loka is talking about the Nam, the chanting, the power of Holy Name, which, which is very important. And he says that uh, it is not because that uh, Bali Maharaj gave all his material a position and he got this Sutaru Loka. And uh, as Lord Vamana uh, Dev came to him and uh, asked for the asked for arms. And Bali Maharaj is like, uh, yes, please take it. And he asked for the three feet. And the third feet he kept on his head. And he tied him up and then he took him down to Sutala Loka. So here, Sutala Loka, Bali Maharaj is happily staying there with Lord Mahamad Dev as a doorkeeper. And uh, here, uh, it's mostly speak about the uh, the opulence of Sutala Loka and about the opulence of chanting the holy name, which was like in the chapter, uh, this, this Loka number 20, which says that uh, even the Srila Bilaval Thakur says that the mukti is not needed by the devotee and uh, she is ready to serve the devotees. And it is also confirmed by Srila Haridas Thakur. And uh, Srila Haridas Thakur speaks a lot about the holy name. He, say, he gives the example of the sunrise, before the sunrise, the effect, what happens the thieves and the rogues, they go away. So even before we chant the holy name, all our sinful reactions and everything is like gone. And the goal of uh, chanting is just for the pure name, the love of Krishna, love of Godhead. It is not for the remove the sinful reaction and uh, uh, for liberation. Liberation and sinful reaction is just gone at the stage of Rama Abhas. They have already gone. A lot of Diwali Shlokas which have been chanted here from Chaitanya uh, Charitamrita, Adi Leela, 317 to 118. Like about 10, 11 Shlokas, which uh, the Haida Shakur is confirming the, the effect of the chanting of the Holy Name. Can you summarize for us what what is what, what is the what is the effect of chanting the holy name? This, the chanting of the holy name is like he's saying here, "Tora prithe raksha jana bhaye bhaye nasha udai hoy dharma karma ati prakasha." Even before the sunrise takes place, the light of the dawn destroys the fear of danger of dangers of the night such as disturbance of thief, ghost, rakshasas and while the sunshine actually appears one engages in the duty and there are like similarly even before the chanting of the holy name is pure one is free from all simple reaction and when he chants purely he becomes a lover of Krishna that is the conclusion, Maharaj. If he chants purely, he becomes the lover of Krishna. Right. That is the goal. That is the goal. He says that is the uh, actual real uh, real uh, conclusion of this chanting. This was confirmed by Haridas Thakura. And what is the example he's giving about the sun rising? How, yes, does, how, does, that, this, how does this relate to pure chanting? And she gives the example of sun rising that even before the sun rise and the, the, the dawn, even the Hajda Shaku says that the sunrise begins to rise, it dissipates the darkness of night, even before the sunshine is visible. Haridas kahe yachi surya udai, udai na hoi amara tumara hoi krishai. Even before the sunrise, 
by this just glimpse of sunshine, we can see, we can see each other, the ghosts, the thieves, they stop their activities, they go. So how does this relate to chanting? You should chant my even if, like, without offenses. Like even if you chant in the offense, even by uh, by mistake if you chant also, that gives us the result. The chanting is so because there's abhinna nam namino because there is no difference between the name and Lord Himself. What to speak of off offering the uh, three world even by Nahabas destroys bondage of karma which cannot be removed by the pious activities, Maharaj. Okay. It destroys the bondage of karma which cannot be removed by the pious activities. Just by Nahabas so, they can destroy. Wh why, does, why does Lord Vamanadev become the doorkeeper of Bali Maharaj? It is because of Lord Indra. Because Indra wanted back his uh, position, Maharaj. That's why. What's that got to do with Bali Maharaj becoming the doorkeeper? Bali Maharaj is already a doorkeeper, Maharaj, because he is the grandson of Prahlad Maharaj. He knew the right thing. But was it just because he gave charity? So Lord Vamanade became his doorkeeper? No, Maharaj, not because of the charity. I would like the Ramakrishna Prabhu to add on this, Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj. It was explained in the verse number 21 that uh, Bali Maharaj, the Lord became the Bali Maharaj doorkeeper not because of his giving everything to the Lord, but because of his exalted position as a lover of the Lord. Actually, I was trying to understand these particular verses because it it contributes a significant amount of uh, verses almost like 10 verses among the 31 verses of this particular chapter so it uh, very clearly appears that Sutta Goswami, uh, Sutta Goswami was uh, very much in trance while he started to explain about the Sutala planet because there he remembers about uh, the supreme uh, devotees such as Ali Maharaj and his uh, grandfather Prahlad Maharaj, and trying to dwell upon their glories, he tries to also say that how Bali Maharaj got all these opulences because of being excellently trained by his grandfather, uh, Prahlad Maharaj, who was very famous because of his ability to remember the Lord and to chant the holy names. That was the preaching which uh, Prahlad Maharaj had actually done. And as we see here, though he is, Bali Maharaj is a Daitya, he... <coughs> Uh, had attacked the heavenly kingdoms of uh, Indra and uh, thereby had stolen away or robbed off from all the opulences. And so the uh, demigods were obstructed in their service. They approached the Supreme Lord through Brahma and then the Lord appears as Vaman Dev and then uh, he makes the arrangements to get back the kingdom or lost kingdom of the Indra by himself disguising as a Brahmana dwarf and going to the arena of uh, where the sacrifice is happening. These full details are explained more in the canto number eight, but here it's very uh, interesting to note that uh, uh, Sukadeva Goswami was overwhelmed to speak about uh, the glory of Bali Maharaj, especially in the Sutala planet. Also, there are references here that uh, uh, once Ravana had come to this place uh, looking for the ring that was stolen, or for which he had understood that uh, of uh, the uh, wife of Indra, or sorry, the mother of uh, Indra, Aditi, and that was there and he wanted to take it away. And right at the gate, uh, uh, Lord Vamandev kicked Ravana and uh, he was thrown away much, much, much uh, long distances. So that showed that the Lord was always a protector of his uh, loving devotee. So the Lord could do anything there for the sake of uh, 
giving his loving devotee, Bali Maharaj, protection and uh, all kinds of opulences in that matter to say. But anyway, Bali Maharaj's uh, story is also very interesting that uh, even though he gave himself and uh, made the Lord to take by three steps the entire um, opulences, whatever he had within the universe, uh, the Lord nevertheless arrested him. And not only arrested him, uh, he threw him in, in a mountain cave. But yet, the fixed devotion of Bali Maharaj was unchanged. He offered and he felt very pitiful about his own condition that he was not up to the same standards of his grandfather. And he was feeling very bad that he was thereby not giving pleasure to his grandfather, Prahlad Maharaj, by not being the servant of the Lord. So all of these exalted qualities and uh, that kind of a mood which Bali Maharaj had pleased the Supreme Lord very much. And uh, more than any other aspects of the opulences, the Sutala planet is fully surcharged with the opulence of bhakti, our devotional service. So Sukadeva Goswami dwells upon this aspect and also we see from Prala, from Prashla Prabhupada's purport that he extensively discussed about the chanting of the holy names, its glories, and uh, why Goswami, Sukadeva Goswami is also speaking about them is to remind, remind us that even if one happens to go to be in a Sutala planet, he should be happy there to take the association of these great, wonderful devotees and make their life successful. That's what I understood from this section. Can you tell us something about Bali Maharaj's attitude towards Indra? Yes. Uh, this is also another very interesting part. Bali Maharaj actually makes a comment that he, Indra had the opportunity of the Supreme Lord also at his door. But then instead of actually requesting him for his deliverance, he engaged the Supreme Lord to go and beg from Bali Maharaj to get back his opulences. This was very much looked upon by Bali Maharaj as an insult upon the Supreme Lord and the lost opportunity what Indra had. But whereas Bali Maharaj very uh, happily submitted himself and accepted both the uh, insult and as well as the punishment awarded by the Lord because he was fully aware that the Lord will always be on the side of the devotees. So we can see the contrast of behavior. Even though being in a higher position at the Swarka planets and also having Upendra as the uh, his brother, the younger brother, Indra did not actually make use of the opportunity that he had. And whereas Bali Maharaj could go against the order of his own spiritual master, but never deviated from the service of Lord Vishnu. So that's the kind of a mood that we can see between these two people, these two personalities. Yes. And also, also we can say that uh, Indra had his spiritual master there also. Brihaspati was there. Yes, my Lord. Also, in this connection, it is said that even Brihaspati is unintelligent because he did not guide his disciple appropriately to take shelter of the Supreme Lord. Huh? On the other side, Bali Maharaj's spiritual master definitely misguided him and wanted him to give away Vishnu. But he was determined and firm to serve the Lord. Right. Thank you very much. Very nice. Uh, Yes? Uh, just, just, I, uh, I want to bring one point here, Manas. Vrahaspati uh, didn't uh, guide uh, Indra properly. And uh, uh, Bali Maharaj, he didn't take the guidance of uh, Shukracharya when he went to serve the Lord. He chose that. So here, uh, it, it shows that uh, um, even a disciple also should be used. He uses intelligence and his devotion to serve the Lord. It's rather Sometimes when he, they don't pro properly advise, like Shukracharya surveys. Yes, very, very nice point. Yes, both both the gurus, <laughs> both of the gurus got some problems. Eh? He didn't give very good advice. Guru <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Disobey the order of the spiritual master. But justified, yeah. at least for Bali Maharaj. Bali Maharaj, of course, he's our example of
Atmani Vedanam that he surrendered not only the three worlds, but he surrendered his own body as well. Because the Lord covered everything, he covered the three worlds with two steps. So he said, where should I take my third step? He said, you promised me three steps. But Bali Maharaj has vowed to truthfulness. So Bali Maharaj suggested that you can take the third step on my head. So that's what happened. The Lord came on the head of Bali Maharaj and put him down to Sutala Loka. Okay, so it's a very wonderful pastime. And some very interesting points certainly come up here in this section of Srimad Bhagavatam. Hearing it explained. We don't see in the eighth canto like this. It's very nice to hear it like this uh, how Bali Maharaj views the uh, ignorance of Indra and Brihaspati that they are, instead of asking for the highest thing they could get from the Lord. They simply ask for something material. They simply ask to get the three worlds. But they could have got the love of God. They could have got the highest thing. The Lord was personally there in front of them. But they, they just asked him to go and beg for them. They got the Lord to go as a beggar on their behalf to get the three worlds. So Bali Maharaj said, foolish, they're, they're stupid, they're so ignorant. They had the opportunity to get the highest thing, they didn't take it. Yes? Also, he does not take the credit for himself. He gives the credit to his grandpa, Pali Maharaj. Okay. He gives the credit to his, to Prahlad Maharaj, his grandfather. Yes. Mm -hmm. Of course, Prahlad Maharaj also came there when he was bound. In, in the 8th canto, Srimad Bhagavatam, it describes how Prahlad Maharaj had actually come there and pleaded on behalf of him, he pleaded on behalf of him to, to Lord Vamanadev. So, certainly a wonderful pastime. It's a very important pastime. For the Krishna consciousness movement. Okay, there's some nice quotes here by Srila Prabhupada. I'll just read to you. This is in verse number 18, uh, talking about uh, giving charity and uh, getting blessings. At the end of the purple Prabhupada, similarly, those who give contributions to expand the activities of the Krishna consciousness movement and to accomplish its objectives will never be losers. They will get their wealth back with the blessings of Lord Krishna. On the other side, those who collect contributions on behalf of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness should be very careful not to use even a farthing of the collection for any purpose other than the transcendental loving service of the Lord. So a very powerful quote, Prabhupada giving instructions to all of us on what he expects. And he's encouraging people who give donations, like people who give contributions, that certainly they'll get the greatest benefit. The benefit is they'll get the blessings of Lord Krishna. That's the greatest wealth. Okay, so we'll go on to the next planet. What's it called? Mahatala, is it? Or Talatala? Talatala, Maharaj. Talatala, yes. Maharaj, please accept our humble obeisance from Radha Madhavati and the Yati Gopi. Yeah, after the uh, detailed description of Sutala planet, there's a very small uh, description about the Talatala, which stays between uh, Sutala and Mahatala. And uh, this is ruled by Maya Dhanava. And Maya, is, he is known as the 
master of all mayas. He can invoke the power of sorcery and the Lord Shiva for the benefit of the universe. Once he set fire to these three kingdoms of Maya, that's why he got the name of Tripurari. But after being pleased with him, he returned this his kingdom. Since that time, Maya Dhanava has been protected by Lord Shiva. So because of that, he is falsely thought that we need not fear of selection of the top supreme person of Godhead. This is this is a description about Talatana Maharaj. Okay, can you tell us something about Maya Dhanava? Have you heard about him before? Which yes, pu which Maharaj. which purport is it in? Which purport? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Which text? It is in uh, text number sixteen, Maharaj. Text sixteen. Okay. Yes. Can you tell us something about Maya Dhanava? Have you heard of him? Where Maya did... Dhanava, uh, his son uh, name is Bala and he has uh, created 96 different uh, mystic powers, uh, Maharaj. Yeah, that was his son. Yeah. That was his son. I want to know about Maya Dhanava. Maharaj, uh, Maya Dhanava also constructed the uh, Indra Prasra for the Pandavas. Yes. In the Prasa, the palace, uh, Maya Dhanava constructed it for Pandavas. Why? Uh, Why did Maya Dhanava do that for the Pandavas? Uh, because um, Krishna had uh, instructed him to do that. Why? Why did uh, Yes. Because he was saved from the forest fire by Krishna and Arjuna. Actually, Indra wanted to kill him, but uh, uh, Krishna and Arjuna gave, uh, gave shelter to him. So, in return, uh, like Krishna wanted him to construct uh, Indra Prastha for Pandavas. I, what was happening that the, uh, there there was the, the forest fire right the Kandava, yeah. Gandava forest wanted ah. to be devoured by Agni yes. right the fire god wanted to eat the Gandava forest and so Maya Dhanava was in the forest right so he was in danger and he kept, he took shelter of Arjuna. He took shelter of Arjuna, and because he took shelter, Ar Arjuna gave him shelter and protected him. And so he, he was so grateful, he wanted to repay Arjuna. But Arjuna said, no, no, it's okay, I don't want anything from you. But Lord Krishna came, and Lord Krishna said, no, it's good, let him do something, let him build this assembly house, right? So Maya Dhanava constructed this uh, assembly house. And what was the special features of that assembly house? Uh, Maharaj, when there is no water, it used to appear like there is some water. The... And when there is no mirror, the marbles were looking like mirror and uh, Actually, when the Kauravas came there, Duryodhana had to fall many times and he got very angry with the Pandavas. <laughs> yeah. He fell in the water, he thought it was the ground and it was water, he fell in the water. And then he bumped his head, he thought it was the door, it was a, it was a, it was a wall. And so he was really, and people were laughing at him, so he was really humiliated. So it really built, up, built his anger. He was already angry when he saw the whole place, just to see the whole construction of the, the fort which the Maya Dhanava had made for the Pandavas. He was envious, he was very jealous of them. But then when he went inside and he started having, the, you know, these... Uh, he bewildered, he got bewildered. Huh? He got bewildered, he got tricked actually. Yeah, he got bewildered. <laughs> he couldn't tell what's the, what's the land and what's the water and what's the wall and what's the door and 
Oh, so he was really angry. And people, all the, the other ladies were laughing at him to see him also, so it was humiliating for him. And that's not good for him. So this just added to his hatred for the Pandavas. Some other things Mayadanava did also was he gave Bhimasen his club, which he used to fight with, and he gave also the Devadatta conch shell of Arjuna. It came from Varuna, it came, but it came via Mayadanava and gave to Arjuna. So he, he was quite involved, <laughs> quite an active person. And what, what was he doing there in, in, uh, in his kingdom? Did, you know, where, where is he living? He's living in... Talatala. Ta Talatala. So what's the nature of that place there? Because it's a, ki it's a kingdom of Mayadanava. He lives there, so... All mystic things and mystic powers. Is it going to be very opulent? He didn't, they didn't mention, but definitely it must be Well, there is a section where they mention, actually, there is a section where they mention about the, the nature of the, the, the place, you know, all, all of the lower regions. Yeah. Right? It mentions about the, yeah, the text number 10. The parks. The parks and the gardens and the lakes and the flowers and the trees and the houses. This is for all, all of these planets. So certainly Maya Danava. Maya Maya Dhanava, certainly with his, with his abilities, he can create many wonderful things, wonderful residences. He says there are many wonderful houses, walls, gates, assembly houses, temples, yards, temple compounds, as well as many hotels serving as residential quarters for foreigners. <laughs> <laughs> So some foreigners go there. <laughs> and the houses for the leaders of these planets are constructed with the most valuable jewels. Right? So, what, why, why so many jewels? Because one... Because the planet does not have the light. Right. There's no light. Yes. Why is there no light? Is in uh, low, in, in their in ignorance, or the lower planet, sun does not reach there. Sun, yeah. Yes, yes, below the earth, there. right? It's below the earth, so the yeah. sun doesn't reach there. No sunlight. So how do they light it? They light it with all these valuable jewels. Right. this is true for the Sutal planet also, where Bali Maharaj is there and the Lord is there also. No light. It is. <laughs> yes, it, even you know, Ila, Ila Vrita Varsh, Ila Vrita Varsh is described that it, it, there's, it's dark there also, darkness there also, that's in, and that's in Jamba Dweep. But it was mentioned, I was reading that in Ila Vrita Varsh also there was no light. So here also... This, this, uh, the subterranean heavenly planets, although it's very opulent, the, there's no natural light. How do they keep healthy then? Because, you know, you need sunlight to get... How are you going to keep health? Are they all going to be very sickly? They don't see the light? What did they say? Maharaj, it is said that they are completely free of diseases, old age. And uh, even though they are 
sensually more agitated. It's free from all these kind of defects. Yes. It also mentions, if you look on text number uh, 13, text 13 says, since the residents of these planets drink and bathe in juices and elixirs made from wonderful herbs, they are freed from all anxieties and physical diseases. They have no experience of grey hairs, wrinkles or invalidity. Their bodily lusters do not fade. Their perspiration does not cause a bad smell and they are not troubled by fatigue or by lack of energy or enthusiasm due to old age. So this is some of the features of this place. Drinking juices and elixirs made from herbs. So although they have no sunlight, they're in this darkness, but still they manage to keep their health. Yes. yes. In yes. verse number 11, uh, there is a mention that there is no sunshine in the subterranean planets and the time is not divided into day and night and consequently fear produced by time does not exist. Yes. <laughs> Would you like to explain a bit more about that? Fear, fear produced by time does not exist. So where is our fear coming from? Because we have forgotten about the Lord, the so fear in uh, fear comes uh, in the form of karma, the time. Yes. Fear comes in the form of time. That we're we're fear, oh another day, oh another year, oh oh I'm getting old. You know, the, it's the, ta the fear due to time, the passing of time. But the, we, in this subterranean planet, there's no influence of time practically, almost, <laughs> almost like no influence of time. They're divided in, there's, there, because there's no day and no night. I, I don't know how they, man maybe, how did they manage? Did they sleep? They don't need to sleep. Krishna Maharaj, so if there is no effect of time, so they don't die? No, they do die. We heard. They have, they have, they have a fear of the Surasan Chakra. When the Surasan Chakra comes, even the, if the pregnant women, they will have miscarriages just from the, the, the Surasan Chakra coming. It was mentioned. But so at what time the Sudarshan Chakra comes? On his own will or like is there anything like... Well, under the, under the influence of time, the Sudarshan Chakra comes. Because it's Krishna's own instrument. So whenever Krishna wants, the Sudarshan Chakra will come. So that means, uh, Maharaj, that uh, all the demons over there, even though they do not have fear from the time, but they do fear of the Lord's uh, punishment in the form of Sudarshan Chakra and that can always be hovering around them at any time. So they have that subconscious feeling with them and so that is what actually they actually fear for. Is how, how we should understand that? Well, yes, that's one way of understanding it, certainly. Yes. But, but I also I want... it, it mentions here is that, that uh, fear produced by Time does not exist. So, fear produced by time does not exist, but other fears may exist. <laughs> but I, if I understand that, uh, actually, it is more of a physical nature of what is being mentioned in verse 38 to 11, in terms of fear. Like a day and night are the two kinds of a situation, where in a daytime, naturally, we become more happier, more... Uh, identified with each other and sense gratificatory activities. Uh, but the moment the night sets in, uh, there is a fear of uh, law losing something or being left alone of such kind of a thing, just because we don't see things. 
or perceive things as what they are in the sunlight. So with respect to that, probably that point is being mentioned here as uh, without sunshine and the time which, which is divided, not divided into day and night. So that's the kind of a fear that is not existing there. <laughs> okay, I have to think about that. It's, I, I also wanted to just to have a clarification. You were referring to that in Ilavatavarsh also that there is no uh, sunshine. But in the, as we understand in the later cantos of Srimad Bhagavatam, we find especially in the ninth canto in the early sections it is mentioned that Sudyumna uh, was the one uh, who was actually on a hunting into Ilavatavarsh. He accidentally went there and he was cursed by uh, Lord Shiva to become a woman. And thereby he became Hila. And later on he was attracted by Buddha, the son of uh, Moon. And then afterwards we find that uh, uh, Pururava was actually uh, born. Uh, so uh, if they had gone in hunting, how would they actually go in the night if there is no sunshine? I was really wondering about that. Well... Did they, were they actually going hunting in Ilavritavarsh? Maybe they were hunting in some other region. Mm. And then of course they went into this place. That's how it could be understood. Yeah, it could be understood like that. I have to look more into it. Uh, I have to remember where I saw this quote where it was saying there's no light in Ilavritavarsh. That's very interesting to And it also Thank mentioned, you, you know, the Ganga also doesn't touch Elevrita Varsh, it falls into yes. the outer planets. Yeah, it flows outside of uh, Elevrita that's mentioned, yes, Maharaj. Mm -hmm. But Elevrita of course, you have Mount Meru right there in the middle. Mm. And so Mount Meru is gold, solid gold. There must Reflection. be. Huh? Must reflection be. of Mount Meru? Yeah, the light is there. it could be light coming from the reflection, yeah. It's possible. Okay, so uh, we heard about Maya Dhanava and his uh, kingdom. And he's in Ma Tala Tala? Was it? Yes, Mara, Tala Tala. And, and next is Mahatala? Yes. Yes? So, Hare Krishna Mara, please accept my humble obeisances. So, this Mahatala is uh, below the Tala Tala, and this is the abode of many hooded snakes, which are the, they are the descendant of Kadru. And their nature is always being very angry. And the prominent snakes here are, uh, it is mentioned Puruka, Takshaka, Kaliya, Sushena. And uh, these snakes are always disturbed by the fear of Garuda, uh, who is the carrier of Lord Vishnu. But, and uh, they're, because of the fear, they are always in anxiety. But uh, that does not uh, let them not enjoy it, even though they are in anxiety, but they try to enjoy the sport with their wives, children and relatives. And uh, so here Prabhupada mentions in the purport, it's a very small purport, and Prabhupada says that this is how the material life is. Even one live in the most abominable condition, but he still thinks that he is happy with his family and children, friends and relatives. Mm. So the snakes are happy. Yeah, they're happy with their uh, wives and children. Even though they are anxious, but they are trying to enjoy, thinking that they are happy. And I, th I think also uh, Kaliya is mentioned as being one of the snakes also. Yes, yes. Kuhuka, Takshika, Kaliya and Shushina. So we heard about Kaliya also, he had his wives and in the, the Nagapatnis, how they were nice, they prayed to Krishna. Yes. What did they pray to Krishna? Do you remember? They prayed, yeah, they prayed to Krishna to leave their husband, forgive their husband. Because husband was very envious and sinful and 
when Krishna was uh, dancing, and so they they just 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 came and prayed that please forgive his offenses against you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. And Kaliya, why didn't Krishna kill Kaliya? Because the, 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 the wives were the devotee and they prayed and he gave them, uh, he asked them to leave the place, they did not kill. Okay, yeah. And he told them, wasn't Kaliya was afraid that Garuda is going to trouble him? Because that was why he came to the Yamuna. To get away Not from after this, because he had the uh, Krishna said, "You will have my footprints on your head, so now uh, Garuda will not even ever come and disturb you by seeing my footprint." So it said, "All these snakes are descendants of Kadru. Who is Kadru? Do you know who he is?" Kadru. She is one of the wife of Kashyapuni. Oh, really? Yes, both Vinata and Kadru. This is one of the wives of Kashyapa Muni. Yeah. And she gave birth to all these snakes, huh? Yeah. My goodness. <laughs> Krishna. Okay, thank you very much. And then next next after after Mahatala is Hare Krishna Maharaj, Dandavat Pranam. Uh, there's, uh, beneath Mahatala is Rasatala. So this is the uh, bird of demonic sons of Diti and Danu. The, uh, that is their Daityas and Dharavas. So they are called the Panis, Nivata Kavachas, Kalayas and Hiranya Purvasis. So they are all enemies of the demigods and they reside in holes like snakes. So from where they are powerful and cruel and they are proud of their strength, they are always defeated by the Sudarsana Chakra of Supreme Personality of Godhead. So, uh, so, um, so they are afraid of that Sudarsana Chakra. So when the female messenger from Indira named Sarama chants a particular curse, uh, these demons become very afraid of Indira. So this uh, Prabhupada says in the purport that um, there was a great fight between the serpentine demons and Indra. So the, uh, then when the defeated demons made the female messenger Sarama, she was chanting a mantra uh, and they became upright and therefore they are living in the planet called Rasadala. Are they also in the form of snakes? Maybe because they are in their holes, snake holes, they are uh, residing in holes like snakes. They, they are also in the form of snakes. Well, it's mentioned that, you know, it was mentioned about the people, the, the residents of Mahatala, that their anxiety wasn't the Sudarshan Chakra, but their anxiety was Garuda. That yes. Garuda will come there to destroy them. <laughs> uh. Yes, but here it is they are always defeated by the Sudarsana Chakra of the Supreme Lord. So, uh, so that's why, although they are proud of this, uh, they have strength, but still they are afraid of this uh, chakra. That's what you, here it is mentioned. Okay. Okay. So, and then finally we have Patala Loka. That Hare was... Krishna Maharaj, we come the base census. Mm -hmm. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Yeah, Patala. This is the lowermost planet of out of all the planet in the planetary system. This is the lowermost planet. Patala Loka. This is uh, another name is Nagaloga. It is full of snakes. And the chief among them is Vasuhi. The head of the snake is Vasuhi. And their quality is they are always angry. They are extremely angry and they have many, many hoods. Like some have five hoods, seven hoods, ten, hundreds and thousands. So, and uh, the main thing is they have valuable gems in their hoods and they eliminated the whole Bilasvarga, all the lower planetary systems by these gems. And there is no property in this place. Mm -hmm. Okay. So... This is the nature of the lower planetary system. So this is Bila Swarga. It's, in some ways it's a little difficult to understand how it's heavenly. Uh, 
to Maharaj, he has it drives them is because hmm. that snake they they in, illuminates the entire planetary system of Bilvasar. So all the planet of the Atal, Vital, Sutal they get the light with these snakes. Okay. Right, Maharaj? Yes. Right. Yeah. Yes. Just like the sun planet illuminates all the upper part of the universe. Okay, so we've heard about these different lower planetary systems, certainly. <laughs> We can, I, you know, after hearing about these other regions, you know, maybe maybe Bali Maharaj is all right at Sutala, but <laughs> some of these other regions are really horrible, <laughs> really terrible. Maya Dhanava, maybe maybe where he is, maybe that place where Ma, that Tala Tala is, maybe not so bad, because Maya Dhanava is there and he's got everything so mystical, so amazing so magical. But some of the other regions, you know, living in snake, uh, bodies of snakes and holes in the ground and, oh my goodness. It's, it's like in the Plato, you know, in Plato's Republic, it tells about the, the cave dwellers. Did you ever hear that story about the cave dwellers? You know, some, the prisoners were kept in the cave and one of the prisoners got, he escaped, after they'd been held prisoners in the cave underground for a long time. After a long time, this one man managed to escape, but he came out into the ground, came out of the ground and he came into the light. And he came into the presence of the, mid, the, the powerful sunlight at midday. And the light was so powerful, it burned his eyes. He ran back into the ground and went away back into the bottom of the cave. And he told all the people, never go up there, it's terrible. This is a ball of fire in the sky and it burns your eyes. So Plato's Republic is like, is telling us, you know, that we're so conditioned we become conditioned to our own little tiny existence. So the same way these creatures are living underground and in the darkness and they have these snakes and they have nagas and these different things and how they live, you know, it's really... Oh. But, but for them, you know, they're enjoying. They're having a good time. They have their wives, they have their families, they have their homes, they have their houses, their places. It's all, go it's all happening. Um, of course, until, until Garuda comes. Or Sorry, in, Actually, I had doubt, half of the doubt cleared, had heard by your explanation now. But what my doubt was, in this, all these lower planets, did anyone ever thought to go to upper planets, like in earthly planet? Whatever do activities we have do we are doing, our aim is to go to higher planets. But this lower planets, they never thought of that planet. Well, it's not. It's not that we never thought of it. It's just what's the reason to go there. You, you know, the people want to go to higher planets because they're looking for enjoyment. But to go to the people may, would find it difficult to think of the enjoyment in the lower planets. Although in some ways you may say, well, there's some kind of enjoyment there. You know, there's gold there in the place where Lord Shiva is. There's gold ornaments. And, and then the Atala Loka, they're enjoy, they're, they're, there's, you know, they're having their intoxication and they're enjoying the opposite sex association. So there's some kind of level of enjoyment there, but it, it's the lower planetary systems, as we heard, is all in darkness. It's, it's, you know, just like, if if you stay, you know, you go to a, the nightclub. You go, pe some people go to the nightclub. It's all dark inside, and they have lights flashing, and you know, you don't want to stay in there too long. You know, you want to get out. You want to come to the light. The natural place. Our our place is not in the dark. Our place is in the light. 
Prabhupada gives the example, he said, just like if you're in the sea, if you're in the sea, are you comfortable? How long can you stay there? Even if you're a strong swimmer, how long are you going to stay in the sea? Because it's not your home. You can't be comfortable there very long. You want to get out. You want to come to the land. Because that's where we, our nature, that's our, where we belong. And so similarly, we're in this material world. We're not very comfortable here, anywhere in this world. Lower planets or higher planets or earthly planets. We're not comfortable anywhere. And we should think how to get out. We want to go back to Godhead. We want to go beyond all this. Now that's, the, that's the idea. This is what Srimad Bhagavatam is presenting to us. That go beyond all of this. Don't just try to find any comfortable situation here in this world. There is no comfortable situation anywhere within the three worlds. Nowhere is there, are you going to find this comfort. The demigods are not comfortable. And the, the lower planets are definitely not comfortable. And on earth we're all suffering. We're all in so much anxiety, and so much stress. So we can't be comfortable anywhere here in this material world. Mamo pecha tu kontiya punar. No, how does it go? Mamo pecha punar janma dukkha laya mashashvakam. Ah, thank you, Prabhu. Yeah, mamo pecha tu kontiya punar. Mamo Pecha. Mamo Pecha to Kontiya to Kala Yamashasvatam. Napno Vanti Mahatmana Samsadim Paramamgata. The great souls who are yogis in devotion, they never return to this material world because they know it to be a temporary place of misery. So we should think like that. We have to have that consciousness. Uh, I was reading Burijan Prabhu's commentary on the, the section of Srimad Bhagavatam and he has several quotes, Prabhupada talking about the danger in the material world and how there's danger just everywhere. There's so much danger. But for a devotee, the, there's no danger. If he's in Krishna consciousness, there's no danger. We just have to hold tightly onto the lotus feet of Krishna. And even these hellish conditions, just like Bali Maharaj, we may say, well, you know, I don't know, it, it, doesn't, it, doesn't, it couldn't be too nice there. But because Bali Maharaj is such a devotee, he's holding the lotus feet of the Lord on his head. So hell becomes heaven when Krishna is there. But if you go to heaven without Krishna, it becomes hell. So the important thing is to be in Krishna consciousness. And then you can go anywhere, you can be anywhere. And this is the message. We have to become Krishna conscious, then we won't be disturbed by any situation. Maharaj, uh, can I ask one question? Yes, please. Uh, like, uh, Upper planetary system, all these opulences are there, they are very happy. So we are seeing even the lower planetary system also, there are some happiness, some kind of, like this is called Bilva Sarga. So what kind of, like, impious people go to that place? And if they are impious, so how do they go to Swarga or it is it is called Swarga with a lot of opulences, although it is uh, like a material word, but there are some opulences which has been described. So do they get, how do they get, go there for like punishment so that there should be some suffering? So what kind of suffering like they have there because they have a lot of, it is, it is like compared to like a swarga? Yes. <laughs> yes, a special karma, isn't it? They must have some special karma to go there, to go to these lower planets. My goodness, you can imagine. Well. Certainly, you know, we, we heard something about their, their nature, like the snakes, they're always angry, they're angry and envious. So, 
people who have that kind of mentality, always angry and envious of others. So you could, you could, they could end up going there. And some people, they, they actually like to live in the dark all the time. They don't like the light. They'll stay in the dark. They just like that. That's what they like. They don't want to see the light. So they're preparing for that life in this life. Yes? Maharaj? Uh huh. Maharaj, from the lower planetary system, how they will be elevated to higher planetary system? Will they come back to earthly planet and then they will go to other planets, Maharaj, or from there only they will go to the promoted to upper planetary system? Yes, they have to. They have some particular karma to take them into the lower planetary system. So when that karma is worked off, then they'll come back up to Bharat Varsha, up to the earthly region, because it's Bharat Varsha is karma bumi, right? They're earning their karma there in Bharat Varsha, and then from Bharat Varsha they'll go either up or down, according to how they hang. So. Their activities, it's in Bharatvars where they prepare to either go up or down. And so they work off that karma and then come back to Bharatvars, just like the demigods. They go up to Twargalo, up to the heavenly planets, and they come back. And then they often go back up again, do more pious activities, come back up again. And so for these people who go down, they go down into the lower planets there and they, they live there in those bodies for some time, enjoying whatever they do there and then they come back up to Bharat Varsh and, and do more karma. In Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna describes there in the, is it 16th chapter or 17th chapter, how the, these demons, they'll take birth repeatedly in such demonic species of life. They'll take birth repeatedly because that's what, that's their nature, it's what they want, they actually enjoy, they're happy. Okay, thank you Maharaj. Maharaj, there is one question from the audience, uh, okay, probably this will be the last question Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, uh, it is said that we get Punya and Papa only in the Bhuloka. And we enjoy and suffer the effects in the upper or lower planetary system. Uh, uh, my query is how free will to be understood in the upper and lower lokas when there is no karma effect? How? How? What, what is how it? The, how free will is to be understood in the upper and lower, lower lokas when there is no karma effect? Oh, free will. Yes, well, uh, we see, for example, Indra, when he's up there, the way he's the king of heaven, but sometimes he will do something wrong. Sometimes he'll get punished. Sometimes his guru will curse him to become a pig. Or he's very lusty. He was cursed to have his body all become, became covered with eyes because he's so lusty. And so we see some, some karma is there. And if somebody, so in the higher planets, as you say, free will is there. You go to the higher planets, you, you, you can live there and you can enjoy your punya. And maybe you can get more punya also. Some people may go up there, they may do more punya and they, they get more pious activities so they can live there longer. But generally, the, the main karma is here on this Bharat Varsh. This is the karma bumi. This is the real place where we're earning the karma. Whatever karma we get in these other places will not be so significant as what we, we're earning here on this planet. Some small amount of karma there in the higher planets or lower planets. That's my understanding.
Certainly, there must be some kind of karmic reaction, some kind of punishment. So there we do read about the different demigods being cursed and so on. Sometimes they do something wrong. They do something very sinful. They get a reaction for it. So there is, there is free will. And if they do good, then they can stay there a bit longer. They can prolong their existence there in the higher planets. And we heard some of them when they, they, have, they, they use up some of their karma and then they come down to Jambu Dweep. And in Jambu Dweep they, have, they still have some punya and they enjoy in Jambu Dweep. So in Jambu Dweep also they're enjoying, but they have also their karma. According to, to how they live, how they act, they're going to get. Either they'll stay there longer or they'll be kicked out. Okay. Thank you, Maharaj. Maharaj, last question, Maharaj. Uh, is there is any Kali Yuga effects in the lower planetary system? Oh, we, ha we heard that Kali Yuga is only effective in the Bharat Varsh. It's not in any other regions. Yes, Maharaj, as mentioned, there is the no time effects. Because of the no sunlight, there is no, there's no time Right. The, the yeah. And, yeah. We and but and we heard earlier when we were studying about Jambudweep that you know that the the effects of the four ages was only there in Bharat Varsh, but the other regions, you know, their happiness was all like the Treta Yuga. There was no suffering practically. The suffering is only here in Bharat Varsh because we have we have things like Kali Yuga. We, so we have suffering. But the other places, they don't have suffering there. They don't have, it's all enjoyment. The demigods are coming to enjoy in different places, these different regions. So the, the Bila Swarga, they're, they're special kind of people. They're also enjoying their uh, lower regions of heaven. Although they're in these bodies like snakes and nagas, but they're, they're actually happy. They like that. You know, just like Indra's a pig, he's happy. <laughs> so you get the body of a Naga, you know, they're happy, they like, you know, and we also think, we're thinking, I'm a human, you know, I'm special, you know. We don't understand, <laughs> you know, we think, because we can, we can get these insects out here, get that dog out, don't let that dog come around and like this. We're thinking we're so important. But we're nothing compared to the higher species. There's so many higher species of life above us. We're really insignificant. But we're thinking, we're, we're thinking, we're great. You know, we're thinking, we're the controllers. We're doing everything. And so, yeah, there is, there is Kali Yuga here in Bharat Vars, but it's not there in these other regions. In these lower regions, it's not there. The Bila Swarga and the Buswarga, it's not there. And Divya Swarga, <laughs> it's not there. They don't have the influence of Kali Yuga. Okay. Maharaj, can I share the uh, open book assessment question, Maharaj? Yeah, yeah, please. There are two questions. I think it has we uh, answered two of the following. So here, it, here it's marked. Explain how the cosmos can be perceived and compare the Vedic method of understanding to the popular modern presentation addressing the plausibility of each. This is question number one. And second one, Maharaj, uh, personal application. Uh, explain our relationship with the universal form of the Lord and whether or not it is important to understand our steady set form. Discuss how you can apply what, what you learned in this section 
to enhance your devotion to Shri Krishna and how, if at all, your outlook has changed after studying the Lord's universal form. Oh, okay. How, how many words do you have to write? Uh, 600 to 800 words, Maharaj. Oh, okay. Okay. Not so easy, my goodness. <laughs> Why they picked that? And you want the devote you want our devotees to answer both questions? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, this is the uh, recommend, Maharaj, from MI. Answer two of the following. Means uh, two questions they have given, we have to answer both. Okay. Anyway, you have a long time. <laughs> you have time at your disposal, I hope. I hope you can find something to write about for this and make you think. Certainly that's what it's all about. We want to think, use our mind, bring our mind to think of Krishna and to think of Krishna's philosophy, Krishna's teachings, and then express it in words. So, uh, you know, I didn't make these questions, so, you know, <laughs> don't blame me. <laughs> Maybe I'll try to come up with some new questions in future, I don't know. Who picked that question? You, you bless us, Maharaj. You know, devotees will, uh, with your blessing, uh, the de devotees will come with the flying colors, Maharaj. Yes, I'm sure you've come all this way. You've come a long way. I'm sure you're not going to let these two little questions stop you. You've come so far. So, this is the last hurdle. So, just put up with it and go through it and get it done and submit it. Okay, so I'll meet you on Thursday night. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Jai. Hare Krishna.